Hello, everyone. My name is Allison langerak Chuzo. I'm the director of ARIS, the Archive for Research in Archetypal Symbolism. And I'd like to welcome you to the fourth event in season two of our Gaia Then and Now, the Mythopoetics of Climate Change series. Firstly, I would like to thank the Germanicos Fund Foundation for generously supporting the series. And I would like to thank all of you for taking part and making these events so special. Today, we're very excited to welcome back Dr. Stefan Harding, who presented on Gaia and the Tree of Life for this series back in March. We have heard from many people who attended that event that they've gone back and watched the presentation again because they were so taken by it. So we are especially excited to have Stefan back. If you missed his Gaia and the Tree of Life presentation or any of the events in this series, or you want to revisit them yourself, you can check them out on our events page at aris.org slash events. Um, and before we get to the presentation today, uh, I'd like to mention that at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button, which you can use at any time during the event to ask questions. And at the end of the presentation, we'll have a little bit of time to take some questions. Um, and now I will give you a little bit of background information on Dr. Stephen Harding. Uh, Dr. Stephen Harding holds a doctorate in behavioral ecology from the University of Oxford. He coordinated the Master of Science in Holistic Science at Schumacher College for almost two decades and has been the college's resident ecologist and tutor since its inception in 1991. He has worked and taught alongside many of the world's leading eco ecological activists thinkers, and writers, including Fritjof Capra, Brian Goodwin, Lynn Margulis, and James Lovelock, with whom he collaborated scientifically for a number of years. Stefan is highly acclaimed around the world for his electrifying and deeply inspiring talks and lectures on themes of Gaia theory, eco-philosophy, and sustainable living. He is the author of the books Animate Earth and Gaia Alchemy. Welcome, Stefan. We're so happy to have you here today with us. Very nice to be with you. Um, so if you saw the last video I did for you, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to start with a bit of music. And this is uh, a Venezuelan cuatro. I was born in Venezuela. So I, I'll just play a bit of music just to sort of relax and uh, to allow, allow us to get into the, the theme with our minds, and with our hearts as well with our poetic sensitivity. That's a joropo from Venezuela, traditional rhythm from Venezuela, for those of you who, who like traditional music. Okay, well, it's lovely to be with you. Uh, and this time, we're going to be talking about um, a book I wrote just recently, which, which came out last year, called Gaia Alchemy. It's about uh, how we can combine um, the ancient alchemical ideas from alchemy about the nature of matter and the nature of existence. Um, in this case, with the scientific understanding of our planet as a great living being. You heard from Alison that I'd worked for several years with James Lovelock, who's the author of the Gaia theory. We'll meet him at some point during the presentation and also Lynn Margulis. So that's what I'm trying to do in this work of mine that I've, I've recently published is to see if the alchemical understanding um, from pre-scientific times, somehow allows us to, uh, to get closer to the Earth, to feel a stronger sense of belonging to Gaia, to our planet, when it's combined with our scientific understanding. So it's a, it's a blend of old and new to see whether we can uh, connect more deeply with our planet. In this time of tremendous crisis, you know, it's terribly important that all of us have a, a lived experience of our planet as a great living being. So we're going to see whether this combination of alchemy and Gaian science can help us. Obviously, I think it does, you know, and it certainly helped me, um, but I hope it's going to help you as well. 
So um, that's just me. <coughs> As Alison mentioned, I work at Schumacher College here in the UK and in Devon in southwest England. Okay, well, look, here's an alchemist. Um, so he could have been doing his alchemical work before the scientific revolution, maybe 1580s, early 1600s. That was sort of peak of alchemy. And first of all, just look at his face. Look how, how calm he is, how open he is, how curious he is. And you see what he's doing is he's making a fire underneath a sort of cauldron. So he's, he's subjecting some kind of material inside that cauldron to a transformative process. And what he's trying to do, and what the alchemists, the best of them were trying to do, is to um, try and bring out the soul in material things, to bring out the soul in nature, the soul in matter, and combine it with human consciousness and then give it back into matter itself so that the anima mundi, the soul in things, could be raised to a higher level. And at the same time, the consciousness of the alchemist, himself or herself, could also be raised to a higher level. So what, what, what they're doing is, is trying to bring about transformation, both in themselves and in the materials they work with at the same time. Um, but of course, they weren't scientists, but they were the precursors of scientists. They were proto-scientists. And uh, we could think that uh, science, as we know it today, really began with alchemy. So alchemy is the foundation of science. And for a long time, particularly after the scientific revolution, people thought that alchemy was a load of bunkum, you know. And indeed, it's true that the alchemists didn't find out very much of any scientific importance. Not really. They didn't know about atoms and molecules, etc. Um, and so it was considered that what they were doing was infantile, regressive, backward, and to be totally forgotten. And it was only when uh, Jung and his uh, pupil and later co-worker, Marie Louise von Franz, began to realize, particularly Jung, began to realize that um, the alchemical uh, ideas and experiments that he was reading about in his original alchemical texts had a great deal to do with his own psychology of the unconscious. That Jung and later Marie Louise von Franz realized that alchemy actually is an incredibly important psychology, which can tell us a lot about um, the, the depths of our unconscious mind and how that relates to our conscious mind. Now, I know you're all very familiar with this, but anyway, just sort of a bit of Jungian psychology 101, really. Um, so Jung was very interested in the structure of the psyche, and he made a very strong case that there's a collective unconscious where archetypal energies and ideas dwell. Um, and these are, of course, a collect by collective. It means that all human beings have access to these. These, in a way, before, in, in some strange way, they're deeply part of the structure of nature. Um, and then these manifest in the personal unconscious, in the unconscious of each person. And, and then we have our ego with our four functions that somehow is fed unconsciously by what's going on in the collective unconscious and the complexes. I mean, you know much more about this than I do, the audience, I'm sure. Um, here's another map. And at the center of, of the whole psyche is what uh, Jung called the self. Um, you see, here's, here's the ego again. This is the persona. What, this is the aspect of ourselves we present to the outer world. This is the, collect the personal unconscious. Here's the collective unconscious, which is actually nature herself, in my understanding. And in the center of all that, is what Jung called the self. And I think alchemically, we, could, we might be able to say that this is the philosopher's stone. This is the part of ourselves that's eternal, that's deeply connected with nature, um, that has sprung from nature and will return to nature. Of course, it's very hard to define what the self is. Um, but what we know is, is if, if the ego and the self become uh, not exactly united, but if there's a connection between the two, if the ego can feel the presence of the self, then the self can inspire the ego, and that makes life incredibly meaningful. And I think that alchemy is about creating that connection between ego and self and the collective unconscious. 
And this is why Jung got so excited about alchemy, because he saw all the symbols and images in alchemy as doing just that, as creating this, this bridge between the poor old isolated ego in which we feel we're meaningless and have no purpose and the whole life, all of life is meaningless and the self, which is full of meaning and purpose because it's connected to the deepest mysteries in nature. If we can make a connection between these two, then our life becomes meaningful again. And alchemy was about doing that, said Jung, even though the alchemists may not have realized it themselves. Um, Jung realized that that is in fact what they were doing. Now, um, the collective unconscious, according to Jung, is autonomous. You know, it's got its, its own vast, mysterious intelligence, which speaks to us in our dreams. But only in our, not only in our dreams, it also sends us symbols. Um, this is one very famous alchemical symbol or mandala, the Azoth Mandala from 1659. Um, and you notice lots of things going on here. We won't have time to go into them. There's an awful lot happening here. Some of us, some of you are probably familiar with this. But the first thing to say about this is that we humans, according to Jungian psychology, we, did, we didn't create this image. It's an image that's been given to us by the collective unconscious so that we can create that bridge between the ego and the self and therefore find our lives meaningful and useful to the whole, to the whole of nature, including other human beings. So I'm just going to focus on this central bit of it to begin with, and notice that there are seven rays in this mandala, and these are the seven alchemical operations. And the idea is that the whole of nature, every process in nature, goes through these seven operations. And my contention is that, of course, these are alchemical operations. These are the, if you like, the phases in our psychological transformation. But they're also, I think, um, the phases in Gaia's transformation through, through geological time. And that's what I'm going to focus on this evening. I'm going to try apply, apply this Azoth Mandala to the evolution of Gaia through time, and at the same time, more or less, to our own psychological transformation, so that we can see that Gaia's, our planet, the planet's transformation, our planet's transformation, is actually no different to our own and they're they're both part of the same process which can be described in these seven by these seven alchemical operations we'll go through what they are in a minute notice on one side just very briefly on one side we have the uh solar consciousness we have the masculine with light and torch and on the other side we have the lunar consciousness the unconscious if you like and they're part of the whole picture as well okay so let's go to the next slide. Here are the operations. So the first one is calcination. That's this black downward pointing ray. Um, so psychologically, this means that we burn off obstacles in ourselves that are preventing our connection with the self, with, with deeper aspects of the psyche and with the mystery of life. And the planet is Saturn. Um, the, the metal is also associated with each of these. In this case, it would be lead. So that's calcination, burning, uh, fire, heat, um, sometimes uncomfortable, can be very depressing, lead. That's why it's rather heavy, can be very heavy. After that, we go to the next ray, which is the purple one uh, on, the, on the left of the black one. Dissolution, water, uh, Jupiter is the planet, joviality, that's a much happier situation. The, t the metal is tin, which is much softer. And here we learn to let go psychologically we've we've released um our, our major obstacles to connecting the ego with the self and we, now we can relax we let go and when we do that we move into the next operation which is the red ray the planet is mars uh the element is air the metal is iron and here we things separate out from ourselves inwardly psychologically that are very valuable. We begin to notice different aspects of ourselves um, that we hadn't noticed before that are going to be essential for our connection between uh, ego and the self. That's uh, separation. So the idea of separating um, and the next one brings these things together. So we have co conjunction. Um, 
conjunction of the planet is the sun. That's the yellow ray you can see pointing up towards the top right, the top left. Sun, conjunction. Uh, the, the planet is the earth. Uh, sorry, the element is the earth. Um, and here, what, was, what we saw as separate now comes together into a new whole. Psychologically, this is, gives you a wonderful solar feeling of uh, wholeness and connection and happiness. Um, but of course, it's not the end of the story. It's like a, um, still we still haven't reached the deepest parts of ourselves, but we're well on the way with conjunction. So that's the bringing together, coming together of um, these helpful elements that we found in our separation. And then we take those elements that we've conjoined, if you like, and we now ferment them. And the planet is Venus, the planet of beauty. The metal is copper, very beautiful uh, metal. So we we sort of almost rot down what, what's been conjoined in us and we allow a new spirit to emerge from that fermentation. It's a lovely feeling of relaxing, letting things settle and rot down and then allowing some new spirit to emerge from that process. And then we take that spirit and we distill it. And psychologically we start to receive some very profound insights. In other words, what's happening now is that the the connection between the ego and the self is becoming very well formed. Um, the planet and the metal are both mercury. You know, this is Hermes, again, of course, the mercurial cleverness and trickster aspect of things. And finally, the last um, operation, that's the white ray pointing down towards the right. That's coagulation. Um, and that's the planet is the moon the, and the metal is silver. And this is where um, I feel that psychologically we rediscover uh, and return to our deep connection with Gaia, with our living planet, which for me, in my own experience, actually, is no different from the self, from the Jungian self. I think the Jungian self is inherently ecological. And I have the experience whenever it happens to me or whether it seems whenever it seems to happen to me um, of coagulation that the self isn't somewhere mysterious inside. It's actually in the planet. I'm inside the planet. It all, it's all a great inside, that feeling of being inside, a great inside, which is the planet and the cosmos. That for me uh, is how I understand coagulation in a very ecological. All right, so those are the seven operations. <clears throat> we can't, haven't got time to go into them in detail, of course, because it's a short talk, but I hope you've got a sense of them. And um, the idea, as you can see, is that they're both psychological and also physical, if you like. So they happen within us psychologically, but also, they're also happening in matter, in the material aspect of life, because after all, we're made of matter. And matter goes through these operations, and therefore so do we, because we're made out of matter. So now let's apply those seven operations to the evolution of our planet, to the evolution of Gaia. And here is a spiral showing deep time. So we're going to go on a journey into deep time um, with the help of the Azov Mandala, which I've just shown you, and, and its seven operations, we're going to see if we can apply the Azov operations to the history of our planet, right from the very beginning of the Earth, 4.6 billion years ago. That's 4,600 million years ago. It's a huge, so you already can get the sense that the planet is so unbelievably ancient. I mean, beyond imagination. We're going to go through that whole process very briefly, of course, until we get to the present day. We'll go around this spiral till we get to the present day. Seeing how um, those operations or whether those operations help us to connect deeply with um, the history of our own planet, which is, after all, as my friend David Abram likes to say, our wider body. You know, we have two bodies, our own little body, human body, which lives inside the wider body of the planet, of our planet, of Gaia. Okay, so let's start that process. This is just again showing you the timeline um, from about 2,000 million years ago, about halfway through the evolution of our planet until now. And just to show you that we humans appeared at the sort of almost the tip of the little fingernail of this hand. You know, very, we're very, very, very recent. But we're going to go back even further. 
to the very beginning of our planet. And we'll start with calcination. So how can we apply calcination or can calcination help us to connect with and understand um, the earliest phases of our planet whilst at the same time helping us to understand ourselves psychologically? Can they, can they be brought together? Well, this is what's been happening. This is what happened earlier or at the very beginning of the planet. Look at that, you see, this is soon after the planet was formed. She was a molten ball of rock. Mm. I mean, the whole solar system was formed out of a massive explosion, which is a calcination itself of a, a big star, a supernova explosion. Then there was dust swirling round a ball of gas, which became the sun. And eventually the dust formed itself into the planet. So this is this picture shows you very early on in the history of the Earth, maybe 4,000, just after 4,600 million years ago. See, she's a molten ball of rock. This larger sphere at the back, that's actually the moon, which was caused by a huge collision with our Earth. Um, also a molten ball of rock. Look at the volcanoes and meteorites crashing. Now, if that isn't calcination, I don't know what is. You know, and psychologically, um, our calcination can be a bit like this, you know, tremendously uncomfortable, really hot, things crashing in, things bubbling out, very hot. I mean, this is classic calcination. I, I don't know if you would agree, but it, it seems like it to me anyway. And um, here we are again, you see the same sort of thing. Can you see meteorites crashing in? There's the moon moving further away, also still molten. This is around the same time, 4,600 million years ago. Notice volcanoes here in the background emitting carbon dioxide into the, atmos into the atmosphere, creating the atmosphere. And there's the sun in the background, um, about 30% or so less bright than today. So it's a hellish kind of situation. In fact, in science, we call this the Hadean after the Greek idea of hell. And calcination personally can be hellish, you know, I'm sure we've all experienced that. Um, and, but calcination is going on all the time, even today. One example, and there are many examples of all the operations happening today in many different ways. But here's calcination today. Uh, one example of it is when we get uh, subduction through plate tectonics, subduction of an oceanic plate underneath a continental plate. And there's melting deep down in the earth. And we get uh, molten rock material rising up and forming volcanoes um, and volcanic arcs like you have along the western side of the United States, you know. Um, so that's obviously calcination, what's going on here in the, in the melting. So that's calcination. Now, what about dissolution? Well, you may have noticed that in the pictures I've shown you so far, there's no water. And when the water arrives on the planet, on our planet, we're not quite sure how it happened, the arrival of water. Either the water came from huge ice meteors about a thousand kilometers across from the asteroid belt or from the interior of the earth. We're not sure which, probably a mixture of both. Once the water arrives and we start getting some ocean, large areas of water, then the water of course starts dissolving the rocks on the surface, which of course have now uh, solidified because things have got cooler. So we have a cool surface and we have rocks solidified and the water that's arrived starts to dissolve the rocks. That's dissolution. Can you imagine in yourself, you've now solidified, the calcination is over, water comes in, it's very soft and gentle and starts to dissolve things out of the rock. And then we move into separation because things are being, chemical beings are now being liberated from the rocks. Beings that were once stuck inside the rocks, if you like, are being liberated. They're separating out from the rocks. What are those chemical beings? Well, there's four kinds you could think of. One of the, 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 the fats, then there's the nucleotides that make up, will go up to make the genetic material, the sugars and the proteins, or the amino acids rather, that will make proteins. So these four components, chemical components that have been dissolved from the rocks, um, then spontaneously start to form in, themselves into a living cell. And you can guess what that is. That's going to be our conjunction. So conjunction is when the elements that, or the chemical elements, chemical, sorry, 
the chemical uh, beings that have been liberated from the rocks through dissolution and separated out, they come together to form the first living cell, what we call Luca, the last universal common ancestor. That's conjunction. So conjunction psychologically uh, in, in an interior way is when we come together into a coherent sense of being, a sense of meaning within our own lives. And in Gaia, it's when life first appears. At least that's one place where we can find conjunction. Um, so I've got some examples here of conjunction. Just a minute. Let's change the slide. There we go. Look at this. This is what living beings, these are bacteria. Luca, the last universal common ancestor, was much simpler than bacteria, but we have no trace of it. But we know that it must have been one single type of cell, uh, the universal common ancestor, because all living beings share the same genetic code, which is very good evidence that there was one common universal ancestor. And look what life does. Look at that. Just look at the picture for a while. See, there's a dividing, growing, spreading, dividing. It's an incredibly complex and intelligent process, conjunction. It's conjunction. This is what conjunction does. It opens up a whole new world. Whole new possibilities are opened up with conjunction. And I've got some more pictures. We'll just look at that for a second. It's miraculous that chemicals, so-called inner dead chemicals, can organize themselves into such coherent states, um, into such a state of conjunction, that life appears. It gives rise to life. Unbelievable. And it's incredible that most scientists don't believe in miracles. I mean, look at this is a miracle. There's no question about it. it's a miracle. And here's later on in the story of life, once we get bacteria, Around about 2,500 million years ago, we get another second secondary conjunction, which is incredibly important. Here you see two kinds of cell, two kinds of bacterial cell, let's say. The one in the middle is an oxygen breather, and the one that's coming in and engulfing it is a predatory bacterium. And usually it would dissolve the one that's being engulfed. But in this second conjunction, that doesn't happen. Instead, they form a partnership, which is called endosymbiosis. And the engulfed bacterium, which is an oxygen breather, lives very happily inside the engulfer, which doesn't breathe oxygen, and breaks down its food for the engulfer using oxygen. And this gives rise to a whole new kind of cell called the eukaryotic cell, which are the sort of cells that we have that we are made out of, that the plants are made out of, and the fungi are made out of, and that the protoctista, like seaweeds and amoeba, etc., are made out of. So just take that on board. The person who championed this view, who we'll meet in a minute, her name um, is Lynn, or was Lynn Margulis, the great American evolutionary biologist who helped Lovelock to develop Gaia. But we'll come to that in a minute. Just look at that picture. This is an amazing example of conjunction secondary conjunction first the luca then the bacteria and now one bacteria living inside another bacterium giving rise to a whole new kind of cell the kind of cells with nuclei that we have um, i've got some examples here i just press the button okay hang on a second come on technology behave yourself it seems to have got stuck on this picture see it doesn't want ah there we go so here we have a more scientific picture. This is the ancestral bacterium. And you can see one of the engulfed bacteria is the becomes the mitochondrion, which is the, the oxygen breather. So all of our heat, body heat, is being produced by mitochondria, which were once free living bacteria. And it, interestingly, we, we get those mitochondria from our mothers. And later on, some of these new eukaryotic plants, uh, sorry, eukaryotic organisms, um, took on another endosymbiont, which was a free-living photosynthetic bacterium, and they give rise to the plants and the seaweeds. And this is the chloroplast. The green beings here are called chloroplasts. So endosymbiosis is extraordinarily important in the evolution of life. We wouldn't have the kind of life that we have now without it. And that, of course, is an example of conjunction. 
you know, coming together again. And here are some living beings. Look, this is what happens with conjunction. This is a single-celled organism called paramecium. See how complex it is. Look at that. All sorts of things going on there that we don't even fully understand yet. Incredibly highly coherent organization. And this is has got a nucleus and it's got mitochondria. And the next one is one of my favorite um, unicellular organisms, eukaryotic, eukaryotic organisms. That's to say organisms that have mitochondria bringing, uh, making the energy or releasing the energy. Um, this one you can see with the naked eye. It's such a big single cell. Look at that. I, I'm always looking for that under my microscope in my pond water samples. Stentor, I love this one. You see how intelligent it is. Look at that. It's got a sort of intelligence. Can you feel that? An emergent intelligence, which is the result of its of the of a conjunction between it and the mitochondria that it has that were once free living bacteria. Another is another example of conjunction. And here, uh, here we have another conjunction. This time, um, not only with mitochondria but with once free living photosynthetic bacteria. This is euglena. That's why this organism, single-celled again, is photosynthetic because it's taken on board um, once free-living bacteria, or rather its ancestor did. You see the, how this conjunction is really remarkable. And it, can you imagine inwardly what this means? It means that all those items, all those bits of ourselves, if you like, that were once separated have come together to form a new psychological personality, a new, per, a new kind of consciousness, a new awareness which I would say is Gaian, and especially if we contemplate the uh, conjunction from a psychological point of view and at the same time from a biological or Gaian point of view, I think it's possible to have an experience of what I call being gaia where we, we really feel that the, our planet is a great living being inside of, of which we live endosymbiotically, just like mitochondria and chloroplasts live symbiotically inside this organism so do we live symbiotically inside the great body of our planet, um, Gaia. You see how we can combine the alchemical understanding with the scientific understanding. Um, then photosynthesis uh, came along, oxy oxygen producing photosynthesis. It's not the earliest kind of photosynthesis, but later on, this is just a little scientific picture of that. Another extraordinary example of conjunction where um, photosynthetic beings take in water, they use sunlight to split the water and release free oxygen, which we breathe, and then the energy is um, captured into sugars through the Calvin cycle, and that, that's basically the, the fundamental energy capture system of the whole planet, which we, all of us, totally depend on. So that's conjunction as well. And just a little bit of, bit more about photosynthesis. This is, this is now a modern chloroplast inside a plant cell. This is once a free-living bacterium. Now, free-living bacteria don't have much structure inside, but look at this. Can you see how it's been formed and transformed itself into having all these different stacks like a complex city? And on, on these surfaces, there are molecules, complex molecules, that bring about the uh, capture of sunlight, and the use of sunlight to split water into oxygen and hydrogen. The oxygen is released and the hydrogen is combined with carbon dioxide to form sugars. Look at that incredible complexity. This is all a result of this, this conjunction between one kind of bacterium and another. And every single plant nowadays has, has these chloroplasts doing this work. And I just want to show you another strange thing that I've discovered. It's sort of more or less uh, poetic, whimsical, understanding. I'm just trying to get the changer to change the slide. Hang on. It seems to be stuck. Um, there we are. This is the molecule that does the water splitting and the photosynthesis. Incredibly, don't worry about the detail. What I'm trying to show you is how incredibly complex it is. It's called photosystem two. And if we look at the center of uh, that system, which is using sunlight to split water, which is at the core of oxygen producing photosynthesis, we have this 
beautiful molecule. Can you see it's called the P68, uh, six, sorry, P680 complex. Look at that. And now this is a, this isn't what I'm going to show you now. It's not at all scientific. It just piqued my in intrigue. This is very much like an alchemical image called the rebus. Can you see it's got two heads seen from a certain angle, of course, it's got two heads and two wings. And so has the rebus. And the rebus is floating above the earth. Um, and many other things are happening. It's life. It's a life giving symbol. Lots of life can come about because of this. Now, I know that's a bit whimsical, but still, it kind of intrigued me, you know, that the, the molecule at the very heart of photosynthesis is very similar to the alchemical rebus. Does that have a meaning? Well, from a scientific point of view, of course not. But from a more alchemical, poetic uh, sensitivity, there does seem to be something there. Um, it's, int it's, int it's intriguing. OK, the next uh, operation is fermentation, you remember, where we work on ourselves, we work on what we've discovered in the conjunction. We let it rot down, we let it bring a spirit, a new spirit to us. And, and of course, in Gaia, Fermentation is actually literal fermentation. That's to say the decomposition of dead bodies. Um, so we can think of it as the cycling of elements and nutrients from living beings into dead beings, back into the, into the living state. Here we can see it happening on the earth and in the, the ocean. You know, there's, there's decomposition and carbon and nutrients from decomposition are returned back to the atmosphere. The same is going on in the ocean. So fermentation from a Gaian point of view is when we start getting these recycling loops, when materials get recycled, they have to get recycled. Otherwise, the biosphere would run out of, of material. So there has to be recycling and rotting down and recycling. And the same with ourselves, you know, the, perhaps the insights we've received in conjunction have to be rotted down in ourselves so a new spirit comes up within us. Um, and then this moves, of course, into distillation. Here's an example of a alchemical distillation flask, you see. So you have some material here in this bigger flask and you heat it. There's a vaporization and a condensation into a smaller flask. And this is a kind of symbolic of what we can do internally, that we can we can take these insights that we've had and we warm them gently. They vaporize and we, we end up with a finer understanding, a deeper discrimination. Remember, um, the planet here and the metal are mercury. So this has to do with mercurial understanding, with, with cleverness, thinking, almost a trickster kind of attitude. Um, what, a, what about in ecology, in Gaia? What does that mean? What, what is distillation? Now, here, you remember I'm a scientist, so I like these kinds of scientific pictures. Um, distillation, we could say in Gaia, is when those feedback loops, those recycling loops that I showed you, and all those food webs that we get in ecology, all those ecological relationships between all the players in an ecosystem and in the Gaian ecosystem, become more and more refined, better at, at communicating with each other, better at regulating the surface temperature of the planet, for example. So in this picture by Ford Doolittle, a great evolutionary biologist, we see there may be different planets here or different ecosystems, and they're moving along through time. And suddenly we get a change. Every time we get a star here, there's a change in which uh, the system, the ecosystem or the planet develops by chance a much better way of uh, recycling its elements um, of being of certain of carrying out certain ecological functions and it's able to survive better because of that and you see this this one here has had two such distillation processes every time there's a star to me it's out, it looks as if there's a distillation and this one here has had three distillations it becomes very very effective at uh, regulating itself at, at being a a self-regulating self planet or an, or an ecosystem. And this is what happens to us internally. We, we constantly get more insight, more understanding as we go through these seven operations. And as we do our distillation every time, we get more insight, more connection, more, more connection between this self, which is Gaia, 
and ego, which is our own personality. And finally, although it's never final because you go round, it's a mandala, so you keep going round. Um, I'm trying to change the slide. Hang on a second. It seems to get a little bit stuck. There we are. We come to coagulation. Coagulation. What is coagulation? Well, for me, coagulation is when we humans become totally embedded in the life of our planet. This is a painting by one of my favorite artists, the Austrian painter Hundertwasser. And you can see this human being um, is totally connected, not just to the human community around him or her, but also to the sky and to the water um, and to all living beings. That's coagulation. You, you become coagulated into Gaia. You coagulate with Gaia. It's coagulation. And that, of course, that's happening with every living being. Um, birds and, and mammals and plants, they coagulate with Gaia naturally. For us, it takes some psychological work to do that, to do that, to coagulate. Now, um, just to say a little bit more about coagulation, um, from a scientific point of view, you, uh, what I like to think is that our culture lost its sense of coagulation with nature, um, particularly after the scientific revolution, when we were told that nature was just a dead machine, as you'll see. Um, and around about 1960, I think Gaia, if we think of Gaia as having, really having some kind of mysterious intelligence, I think she, she wanted to find a spokesperson who could help our culture to coagulate back into Gaia. And that person was James Lovelock, the author of Gaia, the Gaia Theory. I like to think this is, his, this is Gaia appearing in his, in his garden, looking into his soul and thinking, yes, he's the person who can do this. He's an absolutely brilliant scientist, and he was soon joined in that effort to, to coagulate our culture back into Gaia with Lynn Margulis, who I've mentioned earlier, who championed the theory, no longer a theory of endosymbiosis, a fact. So according to Gaia theory, Lovelock's Gaia theory, mm. there are these different components in the earth. There's the biota, that's the sum of all living beings, and then there's the rocks, the atmosphere and the water, so-called abiotic environment. And according to Lovelock, what happens is that the biota have, have huge impacts on the rocks, the atmosphere and the water. They change the rocks that we have. We wouldn't have certain rocks without life. Of course, they create the atmosphere. We know that now. And they keep the water on the planet. But once life has created these conditions, there's a feedback so that the living beings have to survive in the very conditions that they've created for themselves. So we should see, there we are, you see that feedback. There's a feedback between the biota, the rocks, the atmosphere and the water. It's a coagulation, basically, between living beings, rocks, atmosphere and water. And Lovelock proposed that um, what happens when we get this tight connection between all the living beings, the rocks, the atmosphere, and the water, is that we get what we call in science an emergent property. So something unexpected that you couldn't have predicted from a knowledge of the parts in isolation. In this case, the parts of the biota, the rocks, and the atmosphere, and the water. And what happens at the level of Gaia, said Lovelock, is the em emergent property is the ability of the whole planetary system, I'm using science language now, to regulate key aspects of its surface, such as its temperature and distribution of key elements, um, purely as a result of these relationships between all the living beings, the rocks, the atmosphere and the water. So what Lovelock is saying, basically, is that the planet's alive. It's a gigantic living being, a gigantic living organism. And we could think of this as coagulation. You see, it's another example of coagulation, this time at the level of the planet. So I find if I contemplate this, um, within myself, it helps to bring about my own coagulation. I suddenly feel this connection with Gaia, which is nothing more than the self. Um, and I feel the relationship between Gaia and my ego, my personality, which is a coagulation. And here's a quick example of this. Um, this is the long-term carbon cycle. 
can you see we've got volcanoes emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and then it rains and the rain falls on the forest on the edge of the volcano and that dissolves the rock and that dis dissolution of the rock by the rainfall takes um, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and link links it with calcium in the rocks that calcium um, connected with the co2 in the form of calcium bicarbonate gets washed into the oceans where these little tiny algae called coccolithophores i'll show you a picture of one in a minute they take up the calcium bicarbonate and make chalky shells when they die they sink to the bottom of the ocean that bringing taking carbon that was in the atmosphere down to the very bottom of the ocean and plate tectonics then pushes these sediments of dead algae carrying carbon as in the form of chalk deep underneath the continent where the heat is so intense that the, the chalk is melted and that releases carbon dioxide to the atmosphere okay so that's the basic process and we're going to try and apply some of those alchemical operations to the process does it does it work or not um, obviously I think I think we can do that otherwise I wouldn't be showing it to you but see what you think if I can just get the slide to change hang on a minute there we are whoops sorry there that's one of those little algae aren't they beautiful called uh, this one is called Emiliania Huxleyi. they're incredibly small I mean that's that's two microns there along that bar a micron is one thousandth of a millimeter and this is a single cell and those beautiful round um, structures are made out of chalk calcium carbonate CaCO3 every single carbon atom in those chalky plates was once in the atmosphere warming the earth now that carbon has found itself in the chalk and in that process is in that whole process it's removed the carbon from the atmosphere that whole process has cooled the earth let's take a look at those organisms they're little mandalas really aren't they absolutely magnificent it's a single celled photosynthetic alga making tiny mandalas that are made out of carbon that was once in the atmosphere carbon that was removed by the weathering of granite rock on the surface through rainfall and the action of life all right so let's see what we have next now here's the same process but now you can see the words of some of the out seven alchemical operations so um, separation sorry dissolute sorry let's start from calcination calcination is when um, rock is melted deep under the earth and co2 is re is released through volcanoes and then dissolution is when it rains water falls onto the rock um, promoting the growth of forests and the forests start putting their roots into the into the rock the granite rock and then we, we get separation in uh, in that process as the rock is dissolved calcium is released and combined with carbon dioxide that's the sort of conjunction that happens inside the bodies of those little algae the conjunction happens when the carbon and the calcium that were once in the in in the atmosphere and in the rock they're combined in the alga to form the, its chalky shells that's conjunction and then when they sink to the bottom of the ocean and form vast deposits of limestone chalk calcium carbonate we can think of that as a kind of fermentation and when they're subducted the whole f um, and melted that gives us calcination again so what i do with this is i i meditate on it um, both as science and as as psyche i i think of those seven operations happening simultaneously within myself and within the long-term carbon cycle that i've just outlined for you and sometimes it's just an intellectual exercise other times it becomes a, a moment of coagulation in which I would say one has the experience of being guided where the whole thing comes truly alive and you know non-intellectually you know in your feeling in your in your sensing uh, in your intuition that you are part of a great living being that you live symbiotically inside this vast great living planet which we call Gaia, of course, after the ancient Greek myth of Gaia. Um, so, um, 
this is how we can work with this kind of um, alchemical, op these alchemical operations, both inwardly and so-called outwardly. So let me just, coming, we're coming close to the end now, let me show you what coagulation would mean in this cycle that I've given you. And the coagulation is the functioning of, of, a, of, a, of the self-regulating feedback loop that has regulated the temperature of the Earth over within the narrow limits that life can tolerate throughout geological time. So let's start with volcanic eruptions. The more volcanic eruptions there are, the more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Notice solid arrow. The solid arrow means the more volcanic eruptions, the more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But conversely, it means the fewer volcanic eruptions, the less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So the solid arrow in this notation, which comes from cybernetics, the science of system control, means we have a direct coupling. It's called a direct coupling. Okay. So if there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the temperature of Gaia is going to go up. And conversely, if there's less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, Gaia's temperature will go down because carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, as I'm sure you all know. And therefore, if Gaia's temperature goes up, we should now see the next one. If I can get the technology, here we are. There's going to be more rain because there's more evaporation from the ocean. So temperature of the planet goes up, there's more evaporation from the ocean, so there's more rain. And if there's more rain, we're going to get more, hopefully more weathering of the rock, which I showed you in those pictures, which is going to take um, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So the more of the weathering of the rock, remember the weathering of the rock involves the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and combining it with calcium dissolved out of the rock by the rainfall assisted by life um, through the roots of plants, etc., which is why we call this biologically assisted silicate rock weathering. Silicate rocks are rocks like basalt and granite. So the more of that kind of weathering we have, you can guess what it's going to be like. We now have a broken arrow, because the more biologically assisted rock weathering we have, the less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That's what the dashed arrow now means an inverse coupling. The more biologically assisted rock weathering, the less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the less biologically assisted weathering, the more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I hope I've spoken that right. But you can see now we have this feedback loop. Can you see it? So we've made a loop. So if we go around it a few times, we can see whether it regulates or not. So imagine the volcanic eruptions have increased. We've got more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The temperature goes up. Planet's temperature goes up. There's more rain. So there's more rock weathering. So the carbon dioxide goes down in the atmosphere. If it goes down, the temperature of the planet goes down. There's less rainfall. Therefore, there's less rock weathering. And the carbon dioxide can build up again from the volcanoes. And so we go around the whole system again. And over time, we get a sort of graph like this, which shows us that the temperature never gets too hot or too cold for life. And we call this a, a self-regulating or negative feedback, which for me is the coagulation in the whole process. The coagulation is when the whole feedback works very, very well to regulate the Earth's temperature within the narrow limits that life can tolerate over geological time. And as I said, I, in my Gaia alchemy approach, we can coagulate when we think of this or meditate on this inwardly and at the same time um, connect it to the actual Gaian process that I've tried to describe. Okay. So, coagulation for us is living like this, really close to nature. This is Hundertwasser Wasser again. This is an actual little village that's been actually exists as far as i understand probably in austria where he's from that's a sort of coagulated a gaia coagulated community living really close to nature and this is a little picture my son oscar drew for me of coagulation you can see there's the lunar sorry the sun on the outside the moon these are psychological suns and moons you go into the center you combine you you can you can join coagulate 
and you come out as a hermaphroditic child holding the planet between the psychological sun and the psychological moon. It's a nice picture of the whole process of Gaia alchemy where you combine the two. Uh, now, here's an example from Jung. The mandala drawings of Jung, this is from his red book, but in fact all mandala drawings I think are, are a symbolic representation of this coagulation of ourselves with with the anima mundi, the soul of nature, with, with Gaia herself. And finally, we're almost at the end, um, I like to think of these different levels that are connected. So the depth psychological level are Jung's four functions, feeling, opposite to thinking and sensing, opposite to intuition. I'm sure you're familiar with that. And then there's another level, which we can think of as the alchemical level, where we have the four elements, fire, air, earth, and water, assigned, um, connected to the four functions, more or less as Jung did, as far as I can see in his literature, although it's not entirely clear. And on the inside, we have the scientific Gaia quaternity. We have the biosphere, and then we have the atmosphere, and we have the lithosphere, the rocks, that's to say, and the hydrosphere, all the water. And in the middle, if we can combine all these together in certain ways, we can get to what we might call a Gaian lapis philosophorum, a philosopher's stone. And of course, those four inner aspects are related to each other in the way I've just shown you and many other ways which we haven't got time to go into. Uh, and recently, I, I, my son made this for me, but I created this, this instrument called a gyroscope. It's got those same three quaternities, but you can swivel them round. So you get 64 different combinations uh, for meditating. Uh, I use this uh, in my forest when I meditate. For example, this is one of my favorite ones. Let me see. Life, earth, sensing. Life, earth, sensing or atmosphere, water, feeling. All waters, air, thinking. Rocks, fire, intuiting. So to use the Gaia scope to, to connect with Gaia, to coagulate with Gaia, you have to put your thinking mind to one side. Mm -hmm. From the thinking mind point of view, this is complete nonsense, you know. But uh, if you work with the Gaia scope, as I often do, um, with my feeling, intuition, and sensing to the fore, out in the, within the body of Gaia, inside Gaia, then it's possible to have these experiences of being gaia in which the thinking mind relaxes and also takes part, but not as the leader, rather, as Ian McGilchrist would say, as the servant, not as the master, just as the emissary, not as the master. And just to finish, if you want to know more about all this, and read in more depth how I've tried to make this very first tentative baby step towards reuniting science and alchemy through the science of Gaia, which I worked on now for 30 years with James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis and many others. Do please take a look at this book, which has come out just last year, Gaia Alchemy, and I hope you'll find something of value uh, in your own coagulation, in your own journey to the self, which is nothing other than the great soul and being of Gaia, our animate Earth, our living planet. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stefan, for sharing, yeah, for sharing all of this. All of this. Um, just so just wonderful. So uh, I love how you combine the poetic and the intuition with the scientific so beautifully. Really, you're the perfect person to be uh, presenting in this series because that's really at the heart of what we're doing here. Um, mm -hmm. And it's so important to make those connections in this work. Um, you spoke about why Jung connected alchemy and psychology. Why did you want to connect alchemy with science? Well, I, I, I mean, I'm a scientist, you know, I have been since I was a child. And I, I love science. But I noticed as I went through my scientific education, particularly um, as a teenager, then at, you know, uh, as an undergraduate, then as a PhD student, that it was incredibly soulless, you know, it was dry, and uh, meaning wasn't allowed. Purpose 
wasn't allowed. You weren't allowed to talk about meaning and purpose in life. Life is meaningless, purposeless. It's a machine, like Descartes told us, you know. Um, that Descartes said, the whole visible universe is nothing more than a dead machine. And I simply couldn't accept that. And when I tried to speak about this with my fellow scientists and my science teachers, they said, oh, this is nothing. If you think the Earth is alive and has a soul, you can't be a scientist. This is not a scientific way of thinking. The Earth, every, the Earth and everything within it, in fact, the entire cosmos, is just a dead mechanism. It has no meaning. Get used to it. The best, the best thing you can do, the most noble thing you can do, the bravest thing you can do as a human being, is to accept that it has the whole cosmos has no meaning. Uh, I just couldn't accept that. And I was always very interested in Jung from, from a fairly young age, from a sort of teenage, I was reading Jung. Um, and I felt that somehow I had to combine that understanding, that Jungian understanding, a more poetic understanding, with, with a scientific understanding. I couldn't see why not. I thought it would make you a better scientist. After all, Newton himself was a great alchemist. You know what an embarrassment it was to the scientific community when they discovered that Newton spent most of his time doing alchemy. Um, anyway, so that's why I wanted to do this for, for myself and not just for myself, but as a service to our culture, um, if that isn't too grandiose a way of thinking about it, to try and see how, rescue the, alchem the alchemists like Jung did for psychology, to try and do the same for science, you know, to see if we if you could, the alchemical understanding, which after all, if we're right, has come from the depths of nature anyway. If we can combine that with the science, is that going to help us to live more richly and fully and carefully within our living planet? So that's why I try to do it. Actually, if you read the book, you'll see that I, I was almost told to do this in a dream. Um, I described the dream in the beginning of the book, this old Bulgarian peasant woman. I met her in the dream on a ship and she basically wanted me to write this book and when you get something like that as we know you know as people who have been educated by you you, you don't ignore it you know so I didn't I, I followed her instruction and I drew her and I did active imagination with her mm. and the whole book was a kind of active imagination based on on that that encounter with this dream Bulgarian peasant woman on on board of a, on board of a, a cruise ship full of reveling party goers you know like people in western culture basically wow well, we're so glad that you did follow that dream. Um, we have a couple of questions from the audience. And if anyone has a question, please feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, one question that came in says, uh, do you think that the alchemical operations apply to every process in nature? I do. Yes, I do think so. Um, I mean, I could, I could be wrong, but I think so. Because um, they're archetypal, that's my sense. You know, they've come from the depths of nature. They, the seven alchemical operations are the way the mystery of nature, the, the deep mystery, which you can never understand, wants to communicate something about itself to us. And it does that, as Jung said, through, through images, through symbols. And this Azoth Mandel is one of those images, the symbols, from the very depths of nature that wants us wants to educate us into the very nature of that mystery although of course we can't know the, the deep nature of it but it's a way that it's uh, it humanizes itself through the azoth mandala so we can understand something of how the whole of nature works and how the soul of nature the anima mundi the intelligence of nature is working so yeah i i my guess is that you can find it in every single process even in the in the human economy I mean, look at today. Where would you find calcination? Well, it's climate change. What we're doing to the planet is calcining the planet. We're burning it up, both literally by destroying rainforests and other, other habitats by burning them, but also through emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, which is raising the temperature of the planet. That's calcination. We have to dissolve this culture of ours peacefully and democratically, this, this culture, this modernity of ours it can't keep going it's, it's it's if we don't do it Gaia will do it etc so we could go around the seven operations and see how they apply to our current situation well um going off of that uh a question about the operations uh why only seven alchemical operations and do they have to be in that specific order 
Well, some that's a good question. Some of the some of these operations are some alchemists, I beg your pardon, have more than seven operations. Um, but if you analyze them all like Jung did, I think you find that seven they boil down to base seven basic processes. So that's why I like the Azoth Mandala. And seven is a very magical number, of course, in alchemy. Um, and do they have to be in that order? No, not really, no. Um, you have to be very flexible about this, this approach. So personally, you can have a moment of coagulation and the next day you're in calcination. You know, in, it, they, the order doesn't really matter. Um, and it doesn't have to be in that fixed order. And it's probably the same for the Earth. Although you notice that when we looked at the evolution of Gaia over geological time, that it did seem to follow those seven processes quite nicely in the order that we find them in the Azoth Mandala. So the answer is yes and no. You have to be very careful, open-minded about this. One of the dangers I find in myself is to get too intellectual about it, you know, and just start assigning, using the seven operations like boxes. So, oh, this process fits here and this process fits there. You can do that, but if, if, if I do that, it becomes very unsatisfactory. It's only the first approach, you know. It has to become more poetic. It has to go deeper. It has to be enter into the realm of meaning. So the, the thinking mind can assign a process or different processes, a different, different one of, uh, of those operations. That's fine. But then we need to go into a more meditative state, a more contemplative state to see, uh, to allow the meaning to be revealed. Mm -hmm. And often it's very hard to describe that meaning or to put it into words, you know. So it's a meditation practice or a mm -hmm. contemplation practice or an active imagination practice, you could say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can get stuck if you think of nothing but the scientific. And I think that may be where we are a little bit here and why we're trying to bring that other sense of knowing about the earth uh, into focus here. That's right. We need to not abandon our thinking. We've got tremendous thinking about the earth, you know, think of the fantastic climate models that some of my colleagues are making. But that, that's not enough. That's not going to, that's not going to help us entirely. We also need to feel the value, feel the value of the earth, mm -hmm. intuit the meaning and open our sensory experience like my friend David Abram has so brilliantly written about in his book, Spell of the Sensuous, you know, that we need to bring those four together so we can connect with the self um, and connect our ego with with the self. Mm -hmm. We have a question that uh, from Susan: Will AI understand alchemy? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, only if it is if it appears to understand alchemy, it'll be totally superficial. Mm -hmm. Because AI, it just is just based on complex and very clever calculation. It's a thinking process, um, you know, based on network theory, etc. But al to understand alchemy, you thinking you have to put your thinking mind in the back seat, and you have to use your poetic sensitivity, your feeling, your sensing, your intuition. I don't think AI will ever have feeling, sensing, or intuition. Maybe sensing if you make robots that can sense the world, okay, but not feeling not intuition. I don't think AI will ever know the value of a flower, the beauty of a flower, the value, um, or um, will have the intuition of the deep meaning of what's going on in the cosmos of the anima mundi. I don't think so. I don't think you can get that out of lots of little transistors or whatever they are, quantum qubits or whatever in, mm -hmm. in a computer. I don't think that'll ever happen. So mm -hmm. I hope I'm right. Or maybe not. Maybe if we're going to have AI, let's hope it does develop thinking, feeling. Well, thinking it has, but feeling, sensing, intuition. Let's hope it can understand alchemy. Maybe if it can understand alchemy, it'll have a sense of ethics and it'll have morality and it'll connect with the earth in a great way. Maybe AI can then have Gaian experiences, can be guided in itself. Maybe that's what we should hope for. Mm. I don't think it can, but maybe we should hope that it can. Because if it can, it probably won't destroy us like many AI proponents are now saying it might do. Another question from the audience. Um, is there a place for a God that lies beyond Gaia? And it's, and the person says, I mean, out of which or whom Gaia emerges? Well, maybe, I mean, here I like the Kabbalah 
quite a lot. You know, you have Keto, which is this vast intelligence. Um, I don't know if that's God exactly. And out of that, through the lightning flash operations, you get all of the different aspects of reality emerging. But I don't think God, well, it depends on your point of view. Is God transcendent or not? I, I rather go with Spinoza, you know, that God is imminent in nature. God is nature. God is nature. Mm. Um, there's no God separate from nature. Nature is God. God is nature. Um, you might say God is, part of God is outside of nature, sort of transcendent, but it's still part of nature. So I go with Spinoza. God is nature. Um, um, that helps me, helps, helps me to see the sacredness of every plant, every beetle, every bacterium. And connecting from that, another question from Marie, is there a scaling? Does Gaia feel like a mitochondria amongst the larger body of the cosmos? Oh, that's a great question. I, I suspect so. I mean, it's hard for us humans to know what Gaia is thinking or feeling or sensing or intuiting. But if you just leave the science behind for a while, which says you're crazy if you think Gaia has a consciousness, bonkers, you know, we say in English, bonkers, you can't, you're not allowed to, th it's not the scientific idea. Yeah, fine, it's not a scientific idea because science can only teach us a certain amount, quite limited amount about how m matter behaves. So let's leave the science to one side and use our poetic sensitivity. Could Gaia feel herself to be part of the solar system? Well, Giordano Bruno, who I also like, he said all the planets were like animals. You know, I like that idea. They're animals. They have, every planet has a sort of, some kind of consciousness. It's not scientific, but it's very poetic. And, and so why not each planet, like an animal, feels itself part of this larger animal, which is the solar system, which can feel itself part of the whole cosmos as a gigantic living organism. So I like that because it brings a sense of connection and meaning for me. The scientific approach just leaves me cold, stone cold, dead and, and or depressed, living in a depressing universe. I can't, I, I accept the science, I'm a scientist, but I, I just can't leave it at that. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea that our question was just mentioned, you know, that Gaia, does Gaia feel like a mitochondrion in the solar system or in the cosmos? It's a lovely way of thinking about mm it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe because on this planet we have this really unusual um, configuration of life, rocks, atmosphere and water, which we haven't found in any of the exo, many thousands of exoplanets that we found through the James Webb telescope, etc. Maybe Gaia really is like a mitochondrion, you know, like a sort of energy within the whole cosmos, a place where matter has organized herself into life. This, this, it could be like a sort of mitochondrion energy for the whole cosmos, possibly. That's a nice idea. Thank you for that. Well, it's been a delight to talk to you about this and to uh, hear your presentation today. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, and thank you all for being here and taking part in this event. We will continue the discussion. I know there's a couple of other questions that people have. Uh, there's a forum on the ARIS website. Please feel free to leave comments, questions, reflections on the event in the forum, which is uh, part of Archipelago, the Ar Outreach Center on our website, eris.org. And if any images came to mind during today's event, please send them to info at eris.org and we will add them to our Gaia gallery. Uh, there'll be more events in this series, so please stay tuned for announcements about that. And thank you again for coming today. Thank you, Stefan.